You should have received your announcements at 8.30 this morning. And um, there's some new things to uh, notice on uh, as far as some of the, our sick. Jerry Bouchelon was discharged from the VA, but uh, Methodist Transplant Clinic is going to take charge of his liver shunt. So that's probably a good thing, get away from the VA. Um, since they can't seem to know what they're doing or when they're going to do it. Um, but it's the government, so we expect that. And um, John Gibbons, as you know, has had some heart rhythm issues, and he's having a nuclear stress test on the 19th. Um, Lisa Safranoff's procedure is coming up on the 17th. Tom's was moved to July. And of course, Brenda Woods is still in the ICU at Methodist University. And if you're wanting to help with food for the Woods and White families, uh, you can see Leah Connell. She is sort of organizing that. Well, I don't know if sort of, maybe she is organizing that. So check with her. Keep in mind today is our senior celebration for our high school seniors and between services in the fellowship hall and also keep in mind that um, vbs will soon be upon us so you'll want to make sure you're grabbing some of those um, information cards in the foyer and passing those out to friends family neighbors friends families neighbors seem like there's another category can't think of it right now. <laughs> Maybe that covers everybody. Hmm. Yeah, people at work. How about acquaintances? Not just friends, but acquaintances. <coughs> All right. All right, let's get started with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy holy and righteous name. Father, we are so grateful that we can assemble here this day, this first day of the week study together to fellowship with one another but especially to worship we pray that all that we do today will be to bring honor and glory to the holy and matchless name and that we will worship in spirit and in truth we're thankful most of all for christ who makes this possible we're thankful for his great love and sacrifice and resurrection for his ascension and now his uh, rule at your right hand over his kingdom of which we're members and citizens and father we pray that all that we do in this life will be to uh, expand that kingdom to build it up and father we ask your mercy and forgiveness of the sins that may stand amiss in our lives for deliverance from temptation and father a special blessing upon all those or a number that are sick and hurting and in the hospitals and undergoing various procedures and treatments father help us to do our part to meet the needs of others and to take care of others especially those of the household of faith and father we ask your continued blessings upon our nation uh, we pray for better leadership more righteous leadership we pray that as your people of your kingdom that uh, the conditions in this nation will allow us to lead quiet and peaceable lives we pray for peace and free course for thy word and other nations as well for the church in difficult areas Father, we pray that uh, we can be the influence and the salt and the light in our communities that we ought to be. Pray your blessings upon uh, the highest court of this land. Father, we pray that uh, the rumors are true. We pray, and for those who uh, consider the slaughter of the innocent to be their life calling, we pray for their repentance and we pray for your patience with our country. We ask all these things through Christ's most holy and precious name. Amen. All right, uh, we're in Acts chapter, what, 11, and we finished up our discussion last week when um, Barnabas uh, had gone to Antioch at the instruction of the leadership of the church in Jerusalem, and as he was working there, he saw the need for some assistance, and so he went to Tarsus to seek and to get Saul to help him. Uh, and Barnabas being a prophet and 
Saul being an apostle, the Lord, uh, once they got back to this Gentile congregation, once the gospel uh, had been taught to the Gentiles and now the church was composed of both Jews and Gentiles, it was Saul and Tarsus that were given the command of the Lord uh, that this is the new name by which you're going to go by. And we saw this in prophecy in Isaiah chapter 62, Isaiah 65, and Amos 9. But this name Christian is a name of honor. It brings honor and glory to the Christ. It's not a name given in derision by the enemies of the Lord, but it was a name prophesied by the Lord and in the mind of God from eternity, just as His church was. And so, once the church was composed of both groups, Jews and Gentiles, this name was given. Up until that time they were basically called disciples, uh, but now they would be called Christians. And we noticed other passages in the New Testament uh, that to be called a Christian, again, is a, is, a, is a thing to be proud of. It's a thing by which we glorify uh, God. And so that gets us down to verse 27. And in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Well, uh, then one of them named Agabus, Agabus, we'll see him later in the book as well, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So these prophets came from Jerusalem. I think the American Standard says they came down, which of course would be topographically, as, uh, as we say, accurate, geographically accurate. Uh, the Bible generally talks in terms of geography rather than direction. So anytime you leave Jerusalem in that area of the world and you go anywhere, you're going down because Jerusalem is generally higher in elevation in most of the other areas around. Uh, and so... Um, through some kind of sign, something miraculous here, Agabus being a prophet, prophesies about famine conditions throughout the Roman Empire. And that's what he's referring to here when he says throughout the whole world. He's not talking about the whole globe. He's talking about the known world to those people, which was the Roman Empire. It's interesting he mentions Claudius Caesar. This Caesar reigned from 41 A.D. to 54 A.D. So it kind of gives you a time frame here. Uh, we're, we're obviously beyond um, A.D. 30 when Christ was crucified, the church came into existence, and then eight to ten years later the Gentiles are added to the, to, uh, the church. So now we're into the early 40s probably, and so Claudius is reigning, and he is the only Caesar named or mentioned by name in the New Testament. Historians Suetonius and Tacitus and Josephus all mention famines during uh, the reign of Claudius, uh, Suetonius talks about, uses terms like uh, continual scarcity. Josephus talks about people dying actually in Jerusalem from uh, a lack of food. And so uh, Agabus obviously as a prophet of the Lord uh, is accurate in his prophecy. But notice they decided, the, uh, the Christians there decided to each according to his ability to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. That's consistent, of course, with 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, which says uh, that giving is acceptable as a person, what? Has not what he doesn't have, right? And so it was based on ability. Uh, and ability, of course, is a combination of resources and opportunity. Uh, and so... Um, it's interesting it says that they're going to send it to the elders. This is the first time elders are mentioned in the New Testament, elders of the church. And so it would seem most likely, since he uses a definite article, the elders, he's talking about elders of a particular congregation. So if you're going to help the saints in Judea, then most likely he's talking about the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And it would seem they were probably in charge, perhaps, of uh, supervising the distribution of this aid to other, perhaps, congregations uh, in the region. And so, sending it to the elders for them to supervise the distribution. Well, that gets us to chapter 12, and we have a renewal of persecution. 
We haven't really had, seen much of this since uh, what? Since who was converted? Right, since Saul was converted, uh, things kind of seem to have died down for, for the church as far as that goes. But it says, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass, the new King James says, the King James says vex, the new king, or the uh, ASV I think says uh, afflict. I think the New American Standard says mistreat. So whatever word you want to pick, he wants to do some harm to the church. So he kills James, the brother of John. That's James, the son of Zebedee. Remember the sons of thunder. And this is significant in that he is the first what? To be killed for the cause of Christ. First apostle. Right, the first apostle to lose his life over um, the gospel. And it says he's uh, killed with the sword. Um, According uh, to Jewish law, uh, there were only two crimes that warranted decapitation under the Jewish system. Eusebius, the historian, citing Clement of Alexandria, says that James was beheaded. Two crimes, idolatry or apostasy and then willful murder. Now, which of those was James guilty of? Neither. According to the mission of the victim was decapitated standing up. That way his head would fall to the ground. And that's been done that way a lot through the years when it came to decapitation. Unless you were French and you were using a guillotine. Um, and so he's beheaded. Uh, and that fulfills the prophecy of Christ in Mark 10.39 when um, he said, Are you able to what? Ask the sons of Zebedee, or were they able to what? Drink what? Are you able to drink the cup of which I'm going to drink, the cup of suffering? And they said, we are. And they did. And this is the first incidence of that. And so James is beheaded. And this is interesting here because this is right up uh, Herod's uh, warped personality. This is Herod Agrippa I, by the way, grandson of Herod the who? The great who did what? Killed all those babies in Bethlehem, trying to hunt down the Christ child. He's also the nephew of Herod Antipas, who decapitated who? John the baptizer. So, you see a theme, a pattern here. We've got a pretty uh, bloody family. Uh, and he's part of it. He had been granted the title king by Caligula, given territories in northeastern Palestine, and in AD 41 he had also been placed over Samaria and Judea by Claudius. But Herod was a man who was unpopular, and it bothered him. I mean, you know, he's one of these people that liked to be popular, and he wanted the people to like him. He had kind of a groveling disposition and ambitious. Josephus says he was very ambitious to please the people. So this, run, this is uh, obviously uh, the Bible, accurate in all things. This is an accurate statement because he saw that it pleased the Jews. Hey, everybody likes me for that, so let's, let's do it again. Then I'll get even more popular. So he proceeds further to seize Peter. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now what is the feast? When does that occur? The feast of unleavened bread. From your Old Testament knowledge, that is the week that occurs after the Passover. And why is it called the Feast of Unleavened Bread? That's all you're going to eat is unleavened bread, right, for seven days after the Passover. And so Herod, more than likely here, is trying to, you know, convey the impression that, you know, he's a... Uh, he scrupulously honors the Jewish customs. You know, well, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so I've seized Peter, that makes me look good, but in order to look really good, like I'm really following Jewish law, uh, we'll hold him in custody until the feast is over, right? So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads 
of soldiers to keep him, notice intending to bring him before the people when? After Passover. So we'll let the feast go by. I'll honor that. Then I'll bring him out and deal with him like I did with James. And I can't help but to think this is a little bit of overkill. You know, Peter's a, a retired fisherman who's now a preacher, and he's been guarded by how many soldiers? Four squads, which is what? Sixteen. He's got four soldiers taking three-hour shifts round the clock to guard him. And he's in chains. That seems a little bit overkill for Peter, uh, like he's some des you know, real bad desperado. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant, uh, my Bible says. Um, earnest prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Uh, it's interesting if you go into Luke twenty two forty four and look at Jesus praying. It's obvious from Scripture. Well, let's put it to you this way. Let me, let me use an analogy. Some of you have been watching the uh, NBA playoffs. Um, but when you watch playoff games, whether it's NBA or Major League Baseball or National Hockey League, whatever your sport is, those sports, unlike football, which, you know, plays, whether you're college or pro, you play less than 20 games in a season. So every game takes on you know, some importance. Um, but when you play 162 games in baseball or 82 in basketball or whatever they play in hockey, you know, any one game is not, doesn't seem that urgent or as important. And so when you get to the playoffs, though, the commentators like to talk about what when it comes to playoff-type play as opposed to the regular season. How do they describe it? Yes, they use that phrase. They talk about playoff intensity, and what do they mean by that? What do they mean by playoff intensity as opposed to regular season intensity? Yes, yeah, some, you know, they, they've ratcheted it up a notch, you see, because the games are more important. You know, you're talking about elimination. And so you see more effort. You certainly see more effort in the NBA, in my opinion, on the defensive end in the playoffs, right? Um, uh, and so, and, and even in, in baseball, whereas you might have a regular season game and, you know, pitching staff's worn out, they've had a long week, so you leave some guy in there as kind of the sacrificial lamb. I've even seen them bring in position players, you know, to try to finish games. You don't do that in the playoffs, right? Man, as soon as a Guy gives up a hit or two, man, you're changing pitchers. So it's a different level of intensity. Well, according to the Bible, if you look at Luke 22, 44, there are different levels of intensity in prayer. And I think we know that intuitively, do we not? Have you ever prayed more intensely at certain times in your life than others? And generally that we do that when? When there's a what? A crisis. A crisis, you know, adds to the intensity perhaps of our prayer lives. Uh, and so that's what we see here. They were earnestly praying, tensely praying. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, now this is interesting to me. Now he's got all these guards. That night Peter was, what was Peter doing? Sleeping. Now you'd think a guy that's about to be beheaded um, but do a little, I mean, let's think, think about the average guy on death row in this country. If he knows he's going to get the needle the next day, you think he sleeps much that night? Probably not. But there's Peter, snoozing away, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Well, why is P.A. able to sleep like that? As we say, sleeping like a baby. I don't know why we say sleeping like a baby. 
There's no baby that sleeps more sound than I do, or my dog. Why was he able to sleep like that? Obviously, because of his great faith, he wasn't worried. You know, okay, if I live, that's fine. But if I don't, that's fine too. I suspect Peter was familiar with Psalm 121, verse 1 through 4. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not, what? Slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So when I'm sleeping, when you're sleeping, what's God doing? Does God ever sleep? You know, on Mount Carmel, when Elijah was making fun of those gods that weren't really gods that the Israelites had gone after, you remember that? Well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on a trip. He even said maybe he's using the bathroom. That's what he said. He's relieving himself. That's what Elijah said to those people. That's the kind of God you worship. But my God doesn't sleep. He's awake all the time, and he sees everything, and he's aware of everything, every minute, every second, every day, of everything that everybody's doing that's going on anywhere, day or night, inside, outside. So when you serve a God like that, then you're his child. Probably makes it a little easier to sleep, or it should, shouldn't it? Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side. Now, uh, commentators have estimated this could have been anywhere from 3, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Well, what happens when you get awakened just surprisingly so in the, in the middle of the night? How, how, you know, what kind of shape are you in mentally? Struck him on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. His chains fell off his hands. Then he said, put your, shoe, put your uh, clothes on. Put your shoes on. Gird yourself. Tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Well, at this point, it doesn't seem like he's in too big of a hurry, which I don't guess he has to be. So he went out and followed him. And notice he did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. So he's in kind of that stupor, you know, when you get awakened out of your sleep at 3 or 4 in the morning and you're about half awake. And he's thinking, man, I'm dreaming, right? It's interesting here, too, that this pretty detailed description of his mental state has caused some commentators to speculate as to whether or not Luke actually got a firsthand account from Peter on this. You know, like Peter was actually describing to Luke at some point, well, yeah, this is, this is what happened. This is kind of the way I felt about it. Thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were fat past the first and second guard posts, there's a lot of guards to get through here and doors, but nobody's, you know, aware. Miraculous, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So this gate just opens up by itself. And they went out and went down one street. Immediately the angel departed from him. So, um, Tight security here, but he's delivered miraculously. Now this is Passover, so that means there's a full what? Moon. So he's got plenty of moonlight to see where he's going. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod, from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now, well, let's read this whole little section and we'll make some comments. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda, Rhoda means Rose, by the way, came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. You're out of your mind. 
Yet she kept insisting that it was so, so they said, it is his angel. Well, a few things to look at here. Mary, there are six Marys mentioned in the New Testament. This is the only mention we have of this Mary, who is the mother of John Mark, who means also, which means also, according to Colossians 4.10, that she would be the aunt of who? Barnabas, who's John Mark's cousin. And the fact that it's said that the house belongs to her probably indicates then that she, uh, or may suggest that she's a widow. But notice there's many people gathered together, and not only that, there's this gate in this courtyard indicating that she's probably pretty well off. She's got a big enough place for these people to all get together and pray. She's got an outer gate, which does suggest a courtyard. And not only that, but uh, my, the New King James doesn't say this, but I think the American Standard refers to Rhoda as a servant or a slave girl, which means she owns slaves. So, pretty well off woman, apparently. I would also point out that if Rhoda was that excited because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. That probably indicates what about her? If she's that excited about Peter being there, that she's a Christian, right? And so, but of course what's funny is, you ever prayed like this? All these people are intensely praying for Peter. Lord, get him out of this mess. And their prayer is answered, and what do they say? You're out of your mind. I mean, does anybody see the kind of the, 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 the funny thing in that? I mean, is that, so you're praying for this, and then when it happens, you don't believe it. Uh, we ever pray like that sometimes? We pray, but yeah, we don't really expect anything to come from it kind of thing. So there he is, though. They suggest it's his angel. Now, the Jews did believe in personal, at least at this point, guardian angels. And that's reflected in this statement. That does not mean the Bible teaches that. In fact, you can't find that. We find the Bible teaches that angels are his ministers and employed by God on behalf of his children. But no, no verse that, that says everybody has guardian angels. I'm not saying you do or don't, but the Bible doesn't teach that but the Jews certainly believe that at this point. But, but Peter continued knocking. Of course, she kept insisting. But he keeps knocking. They open the door. They see him. And apparently there's a pretty good, maybe even a loud stir here. I mean, people are all excited. But he motions to them to, you know, to quiet down. Verse 17, keep silent. He declares to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. Well, why tell James? Who's, who's, which James is this? I thought James was beheaded. You know, this is James, the half-brother of the Lord. James that wrote the book of James, who, of course, as we know, is a leader in the Jerusalem church. And then it says he departed and went to another place. Well, we don't know where he went. The Roman Catholics say what? Where'd he go after this? Rome, right? But we don't know that. We don't know where his next work was. And the Bible doesn't tell us. So as soon as it was day, there was no small stir, verse 18, among the soldiers. Well, I guess so, because uh, what's the penalty for letting a prisoner get away? about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him, now this is pretty embarrassing. Now think about this. You got 16 soldiers guarding a preacher who's shackled and he's gone. Now that's embarrassing. And not found him, he examined the guards and I guess he wasn't satisfied with their answers and commanded that they should be put to death. So I guess 16 soldiers got, got what was coming to Peter, supposedly. Which, of course, begs the question, 
Why didn't they execute those soldiers that were guarding the tomb of Jesus? And why didn't they execute the soldiers when, uh, back in about, was it Acts chapter 3 or 4? The apostles were all in prison, right? Next thing you know, they go check for them. They're going to get them and bring them to the Sanhedrin, and they're not there. And where do they find them? They're back in the temple preaching. That doesn't say those soldiers were put to death either. Kind of inconsistent. And so I guess after this embarrassing incident, Herod decides to leave town, heads down, that would be geographically, topographically, from Judea to Caesarea, because actually he's going north to Caesarea on the coast, which is the Roman headquarters in Palestine, as we've talked about before, where Cornelius lived. Well, um, now it's time for this sorry individual to get what's coming to him. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now, where's Tyre and Sidon? Phoenicia, two major cities of Phoenicia, those hundred and so miles of land above Mount Carmel, north of Mount Carmel on the Mediterranean coast. They'd been at odds, and I guess he was supplying their grain, so they're lacking some food. So they decide to make up with him, and they come to uh, Blastus. The, new, the King James says the king's chamberlain. It's his personal aide, according to the new King James. He's an officer in charge of household duties, so he's close to him. Um, a trusted personal servant, I think the NIV says. And isn't that what people do today? You want to get into a pot with a politician. You know, you, you approach his aide, try to get in good with somebody close to him. So that's what they did. And they make him their friend. They ask for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. And apparently that kind of fallen off with their disagreement. So, on a set day, some commentators speculate this is Caesar's birthday, August the 1st. Herod arrayed in royal apparel. Josephus records that he was clothed in a silver garment that glistened in the morning sun. Sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Well, here's a guy that wants to please the people, right? Man, he's feeling good. Um... I mean, he was unpopular, and so he was anxious for their favor. And this made him feel good. And he didn't rebuke them for saying that, according to Josephus. The Bible says immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Josephus says that after an agonizing five days of suffering, he died at the age of 54. So, what a bad way to go. But it couldn't help him to a nicer fellow, right? So, Herod's out of the way. So, what does that mean for the church? Verse 24. You try to persecute the church? Remember, Saul was doing that, and what happened? The disciples did what? Went everywhere preaching the gospel. Herod tries to, and what happens? He gets the worms, and verse 24 says, The word of God grew and multiplied. Now that's a figure of speech, the cause put for the effect, right? What was growing and multiplying? What does that mean that the word of God grew and multiplied? Yeah, people are obeying the gospel. They're becoming Christians. It's the effect that the Word of God is having. Verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. So all this is happening about the same time. They fulfilled their mission. They return their mission to Jerusalem with the, the money that was sent. When they had fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And so they leave Jerusalem and they head back to Antioch of Syria. 
And they take John Mark because he's related to Barnabas. So we've got a little nepotism going on here, right? I'm just joking. Um, John, Yohanan, Yahweh has shown grace. Mark, Marcus is a Roman name or a Latin name. And we know that he's a native of Jerusalem, right? His mother Mary had a sizable house there. Cousin of Barnabas, Colossians 4.10. And we'll see later that uh, he becomes a source of contention uh, between Paul and Barnabas. So, from this point on, beginning in chapter 13, we're going to see a change in emphasis in Luke's writing and the Holy Spirit's inspiration here from the efforts of who to who. Yeah, we change from Peter and really following Peter mostly to now the exploits and the travels and the work and the labor of Paul. It's going to cover about 20 years of New Testament history from about A.D. 45 to about A.D. 65. And so as I've mentioned before, um, it's easy sometimes we forget. You're reading the book of Acts and you think, um, you read these events and you think, oh, these are just, you know, they're just happening right after, you know, each other, right on top of each other. And that's not the case. There's a lot that's not recorded. In fact, a lot more that's not recorded about these people's lives than what is. But it does occur over about a 20-year period from here to the end of the book. Have a strong contingency of leaders here in the church at Antioch. Now, in the church that it was Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. And here's some particular ones. Barnabas, we know, is a prophet. Simeon, a Jewish name who was called Niger, which means black. Lucius of Cyrene, or Cyrene, Lucius is a Roman name. Menaean, this is an interesting one, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Herod Antipas, the one who murdered John the Baptizer. Isn't that interesting? I know we don't have any families here, or you don't know of any families where one person is a real strong, devout Christian and the other could just care less about it. You don't know anybody like that, do you? Or friends. But that's the way, the way it is in the world. And that's what Jesus said, right? A man's enemies will be those of what? His own household. And so that's what the gospel does. It divides. People think division's always bad, and it's not. A lot of times it is, but it's not always. And so here's who's two fellows that were brought up in the same household, and now one um, is a leader in the Lord's church. The other one's just a common political murderer. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, how about that? By the way, that word for minister there is a technical term, priestly term, signifies priestly service. Well, who's the temple of the Lord today? Church is. According to 1 Peter 2, 9, we're all what? We're all priests. Christ is our high priest. We're all priests. So while they're performing priestly service to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, fasting, by the way, is what? You abstain from what? Food and water. There's no direct command in the New Testament that says you have to fast, but people did it for spiritual reasons. And I've known of people today to do it. It says it makes them more spiritually focused and aware. So fasting is not a bad thing may provide a spiritual element to one's life. I think the problem with most of us is we just like to eat, right? We probably like to eat too much. But they fasted and the Holy Spirit said, well, the Holy Spirit, 
He's a personality. He said to them. He didn't, it didn't say the Holy Spirit felt them or they felt him. He talked to them. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. I've called them for my work. They, have, they then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now why did they lay their hands on these two missionaries? Did they lay hands on them to give them some kind of spiritual gifts? True or false? False. I don't see any apostles here. And besides, Saul's already an apostle. And Barnabas is already a prophet. They don't need any laying of hands on them to impart any kind of spiritual gifts. The laying on the hands is a ceremonial thing, formalizes the occasion, represents a, a vote of confidence by the other leaders in the church there. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, verse 4, they went down to Seleucia, the only time this particular place is mentioned in the New Testament. That's 16 miles to the west. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. We mentioned Cyprus, Barnabas' home. It's 60 miles off the Palestinian coast in the Mediterranean Sea. It's 140 miles long and 50 miles wide. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the, now notice, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. What does that tell me? Well, there's a lot of Jews there. It took 10 dedicated Hebrew men to constitute a synagogue, and they got more than one, several. And they're preaching in the synagogues, and John Mark is their, my Bible says, assistant. Uh, American Standard says attendant, I believe. Just a helper. But the idea here is that it's a person who willingly submits himself. He wasn't their slave or their employee. He just went along to help them out, voluntarily submitted himself to their lead. In classical Greek, the word used for this is the aid of a military commander. So John Mark is their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. Well, we've seen sorcerers before. So they go 90 miles across the island to the southwest coast to Paphos, which was the seat of the Roman government on the island. Also noted for its worship of a goddess called Paphian, who was identified with the Greek Aphrodite. And they come upon this false prophet which is kind of curious, a certain sorcerer, which is kind of curious to me because he's Jewish. So we got this Jew who's practicing sorcery, believes he has some kind of magical power, and we've run into that before, Simon. But this guy's name was Bar-Jesus. What does that mean, Bar? Son of. He's also called Elimus, which is Arabic for wise. And notice he's with the proconsul, his best customer for this fraud is a guy by the name of Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. What was a proconsul? What was a proconsul in the Roman Empire? He was the administrator of a senatorial province. Provinces in the Roman Empire were divided into senatorial and imperial. That is, they were run by the Senate or they were run by the emperor. And if you were the administrator of a senatorial province, you were called a proconsul. If you were the administrator of an imperial province, you were called proprietor. Now, there used to be critics of the Bible that said, nah, there wasn't any proconsul on Cyprus at this time. This was an imperial province. The fact of the matter was, Cyprus went back and forth between being a, an imperial and a senatorial province. And the interesting thing is, is that eventually there was some archaeological evidence found with Sergius Paulus listed as, guess what? Proconsul of Cyprus. Um, so his position and name were confirmed by archaeology. 
Well, we'll read more about this interesting account because there's something unusual about this miracle that we're about to see. What is it as we leave? What's unusual about the miracle we're about to see? As opposed to most miracles. It's a punitive miracle, not a benevolent one. Just about all miracles we read about in the New Testament are benevolent. They help somebody. This one actually punishes somebody. So think about this as you leave. The next time you run into somebody that says they can perform miracles, well, yeah, I can fix somebody's strain, strain muscle in their back. I can fix their headache. Well, can you strike your enemies blind? That's the question. Can you do that? I'd like to see that one. All right, we'll pick up there next week.